Yeah, welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. And we still are in our section on random number generation with our application of a Monte Carlo approximation or the special case of a Monte Carlo integral in the background. So I like to continue on random number generation, but today I like to discuss how we generate random number sequences, so drawings of other distributions. So maybe let's start with a small motivation. As mentioned in the background is our Monte Carlo methods. So the Monte Carlo method tries to approximate the expectation. So there is here the expectation of a random variable X. And the theoretical result is that we can approximate it here by the time average of I ID random variables X I. And then when we move to the Monte Carlo integration, a step that we did was to apply here a function of f, a function f to uh, the xi to get another sequence zi. And of course, that sequence zi is also iid. So we had that the same approximation result now holds for zi approximating, yeah, so the time average of the set i's, approximating the expectation of the set, yeah, the set one or whatever. So the f of x. And we used this little result in a special case, namely we considered x to be uniform distributed. So we had then an integral over zero one yeah, on the right hand side. And this then constituted our Monte Carlo integration. Uh, of course, we already studied uh, applications where we integrated over different domains. Yeah? And the tool was to just transform the integral from the domain of interest to the domain zero one, yeah? so by the rule of substitution. So we already had some transformations. And this is now the topic that we are in many application interested in uh, performing here this approximation, so the expectation. But now with a random variable X that has a distribution that is different from the uniform distribution. So for example, normal, log normal, exponential, gamma, whatever. Uh, so we're going back to the original definition of the Monte Carlo approximation, we can just now do the same. So we are interested in approximating the expectation of a function f of x, x having some other distribution. I know that I can uh, approximate this by a sequence of iid random variables, now xi <coughs> having the same distribution as x f of xi, and then we did this, well, maybe not completely admissible thing that we plugged in a single event omega. Well, we later had the cox malafka inequality that showed us, okay, if this sequence here, the sequence xi, which is just the random variable xi evaluated at the event omega has low discrepancy, then we have also a nice convergence yeah, without uh, the probability in our convergence result, so a non-probabilistic convergence rate. So it was admissible to just uh, use this event omega if the sequence xi that we generate has nice properties. So now I'm interested here in a sequence xi that has um, a distribution that is different from the uniform distribution. So I like to generate a random number sequence of a different distribution. Okay, examples for this are here the normal distributed random variable x. Yeah, it will appear very often. Yeah, example on the next slide. 
exponentially distributed random variables. They occur, for example, if you model arrival times, yeah, default times, then you like to sample a sequence of such times or other examples log normal, of course, yeah, in the Black Schultz model. Could also be thought of just being a diff transformation of the normal one or gamma or whatever distributed random variables. Yeah, let's have a small uh, motivation from mathematical finance. You maybe recall the universal pricing theorem. So you have that the value of a derivative. So here I'm looking at the value of the derivative. V is here my value process, my value function. The value of a financial derivative is given here as an expectation of the future value. V of T, well, multiplied with the ratio of the numerea, numerea at evaluation time divided by the numerea at uh, payment time or observation time under the corresponding equivalent martingale measure. So we have this theorem, yeah, which relies on that we can build a replication portfolio, which makes everything risk neutral. Hence, we can move to equivalent martingale measure yeah, where the relative prices are martingales. And then we have this nice property that also the relative price of the derivative has to be a martingale uh, because the replication portfolio is a linear combination of relative prices. And we get this nice, nice little result. Um, here in this theorem, the capital V of T, so the future value of my uh, financial derivative is a function of a stock. If I, for example, consider the case of a call option. So this here is now a call option. It's a function of the stock value at the future point in time, capital T. So this here is the value of the stock in time, uh, capital T. So if we consider the special case of a call option. So the call option is that we have here the maximum of the value of the stock at capital T minus K and zero. Then if we choose a specific numerator, let's for example, just choose here the terminal measure. Okay, that is nice because then I can just plug in the zero copper bond price for this ratio here. Yeah, so you see this here is just the zero copper bond price, but that's the detail that's not so important now. You see that I just calculate the expectation of a function G. So we have here a function G of the value of the stock at capital T, yeah, and that is seen from little t, my valuation point, um, a random variable. So we are already in the situation that I have to value here a function g of a random variable. So the function g is also given here. It's my payoff function, maximum of x minus k and zero. Well, the discounted payoff function, because I multiply with the zero cover point of the random variable S of capital T, and surely this S of capital T, the value of the stock is not uniform. So it is an example for this situation where I'm interested in this expectation function of this random variable. Yeah, furthermore, I can now assume a model. So now I assume a model. Let's, for example, assume the plot schultz model. So the plot schultz model tells me that the dynamic, so an infinitesimal change of the stock is uh, RS dt plus sigma s dw. Okay, that is, I'm already under the equivalent martingale measure. Um, well, from that model, I can now explicitly calculate the value of 
the random variable s of capital T. Well, I know the logarithm of s follows a normal process. So by just saying, okay, you divide here by s, and then you see that is more or less, yeah, you have to check into slammer. That is the derivative of the logarithm. But on the right hand side, you see it's just a normal process, a drift RDT plus sigma dw, dw from motion is uh, normal increments. Uh, so you, you have easily that the logarithm of S of capital T is given by the initial value log of zero plus R times capital T, the integral of that plus sigma W of T, so the integral of that. And that guy here comes from, from Ito Slammer, your, your drift adjustment. Taking the exponential, I now have a nice representation that the random variable that gives me or describes me or models the value of the stock at capital T is here given by this expression. So that's a function yeah, of a normal distributed random variable. X, yeah, why is that? Okay, because this guy here is normal distributed with mean zero and standard deviation square root of capital T. Okay, then I take a standard normal, say X is now a standard normal, and I just scale it here with this little factor square root of capital T. So I can represent my model quantity also as a function of some other nice random variable. So I have here, this is an H, a function H of the random variable X and X is now standard normal. So if I compose the both, both parts, I have the random uh, variable that drives my risk here. It is standard normal. So this is my stochastic driver. Then I have the function H and the function H constitutes the model. So the function H constitutes the model for the stock. Yeah? So it could be Black Scholes, like in that example, could also be Bachelier, whatever model that is driven by this Brownian driver. And the function G, the function G now constitutes the financial product that I like to value, the payoff function. So this is the product. So in our case, it was a call option, yeah, but you could have a general payoff function. So if you plug these three guys together, yeah, I can say this is a function F. So my function F is the G of H of X. And you see that my universal pricing series, my valuation formula is exactly of this form. Calculate the expectation of a function F of a random variable X. And now my X is normal distributed. Uh, so here in this motivation, maybe this is already nice that I um, separated a few components. Yeah? So I'm separating my driver X, a normal distributed random variable, then my model for the stock S. Yeah? So this is here the function H and my financial product. And this is maybe something which we also will do later to design a little bit our program in separating these aspects that have some relevance in the application. Because maybe sometimes we like to combine different financial products with different models or different numerical methods in generating the X. And that's maybe a little bit the focus now that we like to look at how can we now generate random drawings for a random variable X that has a different distribution like in that example here, a normal one. Yeah, a few more comments uh, on applications. 
if you would have a financial product that would depend not only on the value of the stock at one time, but on different times, then it's maybe relevant how the Brownian motion looks between these times. So you would introduce a dependency on the Brownian increments here. So every such increment of Brownian motion is normal distributed with mean zero and standard deviation square root the time step size. So you could maybe write this financial product as a function of a vector of normal distributed random variables. And if these are now time increments for successive time intervals, these random variables are independent. Yeah. So you see, you can easily create here a high dimensional space by looking at something that depends on the value of the stock at different times, which means it depends on the value of the Brownian motion at different times, the value of the Brownian increments for different time steps. So I move from normal distribution in one dimension to multivariate normal distribution. Another example I already mentioned default times in the standard intensity model for default times, you model the default time tau. So the time when uh, an event, yeah, a catastrophic event or whatever happens as exponential distributed. So we have the question, how do we generate an exponential distribution? And it has a parameter lambda. And a last uh, remark, a last example, in a multi-factor term structure model, multi-factor interest rate model, uh, the Brownian motion is actually itself vector valued. So this guy here is already a vector. So you consider a multivariate normal distribution already in every time step. So in that case here, where delta W yeah, is um, a vector value prone in motion, you would consider maybe such a vector. So you have delta W, okay, depends now how you count zero, delta W one, and so on, yeah. Delta W say M minus one Ti. Yeah. So this is an M vector of Brownian increments. So you can also become higher dimensional by looking at multiple such Brownian drivers. For example, if you have also multiple stocks that have some independent movements you know, or correlated movements, you could start by expressing them as a function of those increments. So my topic is generate drawings of other distributions. So usually when you look at random number generators, they usually give you equidistributed random numbers. So uniforms on zero one. Well, if you look back to the implementation of the Java util random of the linear concurrential random number generators, actually they gave us integers and we transformed the integer, which was maybe between zero and a large number, uh, M zero included, M not included. We transformed it by just taking the random number, the random integer, x and we divided it by m. So we get something that is between zero and one, zero included yeah, because of this special form, one not included. So we assume now the existence of such random numbers and we will discuss how can we create drawings from other distributions given such a sequence. So I assume the existence of a random number generator for uniform random variables. And our question is, how do we generate a sequence that represents drawings of other distributions from this 
uniform sequence. A very prominent method, yeah, maybe also to some extent the best method if you have an ICDF available is the inversion of the distribution function. So if you have a distribution function F, or let's say if you have the inverse of F, then you can create F distributed random numbers by just applying this inverse of F to the uniform sequence. So I need an inverse of the distribution function. So first recall F is a distribution function. If F of little x, so is a distribution function for a random variable capital X. If F of little x is just the probability that my random variable x is less or equal little x. So I need to have an inverse of this. So first we need to define the inverse because in general, it's not necessarily the case that F is strictly monotone. So maybe there is no inverse. Yeah, this is clear if you just plot, for example, a distribution function. So how can it look like? So for example, my distribution function is constant here. Yeah, then it's maybe have a linear slope. Okay, so there is some probability that I'm inside this interval. And then it's maybe constant again, and there's again some linear slope here, yeah, and then it's maybe one. So that means that here in this interval, so let's call this interval here A and B, the probability that the random variable lies in this interval is just zero. So which means that my distribution function doesn't change yeah, if I change the x. So how do I now invert my function? Yeah? So this is my y of x. So if I look, how do I invert the function? Yeah, I would like to have a value x for every given value y. So how would the inverse look like? So I'm... I maybe start here at this point. So I have here, something goes up like here, and then I have some linear slope. So this linear slope here corresponds to that linear slope. And now it goes up a little bit. So this corresponds here to say, this horizontal line. Yeah? And then I have again a linear slope. So a straight line and I'm, and I'm done, yeah? So this here is my interval, say from zero to one, yeah? And maybe there's something happening here below. I don't care. Okay, so the question is a little bit the red area. Yeah, what do we do in the red area? How do we invert uh, the function? Because in, the red area. So if I ask myself, what is the corresponding value here for this y? Okay, there are many, many possibilities. Yeah, many values of x lead to this because the probability that I lie in this interval is zero. So I can just have here different values of x and I must somehow choose one. So to make this definition of the inverse now unique, I just choose the smallest one, I choose the infimum. So I define here the inverse of the distribution function by looking at the set of all arguments x to f that are larger than y. From that set, I take the infimum, yeah? So if there's just a single point, f of x is equal y, that is just itself, yeah? But if there are multiple, yeah, if there's non-uniqueness, I take just the smallest one, or let's say I take the infimum. So I take the infimum 
of all the guys x for which f of x is larger than y. So if you go back to the picture, you would take here the, the smallest point yeah, is your value x for this corresponding value y here. Okay, so that guy is included. That guy here is not included. So that's now my definition, my generalization of the inverse of the distribution function. Here, maybe a bit nicer, the picture that I've just drawn. And whenever you have such a region here of non-uniqueness, which is like that here, you take just the infimum of this set. Uh, first remark, um, the distribution function is right continuous. So the distribution function is right continuous because here in our definition, we have f of little x is the probability that capital X is less or equal x. So to show that it's right continuous, I have to look at epsilons larger than zero. So I'm coming from the right yeah, and uh, I'm then approaching the point f, x, sorry. I'm coming from the right, so I'm approaching then the point x. So it's right continuous in x. And I just look at f of x plus epsilon minus f of x. So just plug in the definition so this is the probability that capital X is less or equal X plus epsilon minus the probability that capital X is less or equal X. So minus the probability means that I'm looking at the inverse event. So it is not in this set. Yeah? So I'm cutting it out. So this means that actually X is strictly larger than little x but less or equal x plus x epsilon. Yeah? So from the less or equal, I get here that x plus epsilon is included in this interval, but from the less or equal with the minus here, yeah? so I'm subtracting that probability, so it should not be in that set. I get that this is the open set, so x is not included. So that is actually the probability that capital X is in between X and X plus epsilon, X not included, X plus epsilon included. So, and now if you let epsilon go to zero, you see that this is just the probability of the empty set. Yeah, so it's just a zero. If you would go from the left-hand side, yeah, would would have an interval that is left close, right open. Yeah. And then there is the single point X in, inside this interval and could be that X had some point mass. Yeah. So it could be that then the distribution function would be not continuous from the left. So this means that I can write instead of the infimum, I can write the minimum in the previous definition. So actually here I can write minimum, yeah, the infimum is attained, it's in the set. I just mentioned this here because it is useful for the proof of the next lemma because now comes the cool lemma. Let U be a uniform distributed random variable, uniform on zero one, and let f be a given distribution function, then if I define now x as just f inverse applied to u, so I define the random variable x by taking the uniform and transform it using f inverse, then this x has distribution function f. 
Yeah? So X is F distributed. So I can create an F distributed random variable X using just this technique of the inversion of the distribution function. And also if this F is continuous, then you have some kind of round trip. If you apply F again to X, then this uh, is again uniform. So let's prove this lemma. So first just maybe recall the definition. X has the distribution function F. This means that F of little x is the probability that capital X is less or equal little x. And I will first show some auxiliary result. So this thing that is inside this definition of here, this infimum, yeah, or now the minimum guy, okay, was f of x larger or equal y. You can apply f inverse on the left and the right, which would then formally get you that x is larger or equal f inverse y. Or you could apply again f on the left hand side and the right hand side, which would then get, get you formally f of x is larger or equal y. So you can just, just move the f via f inverse to the other side. So I will first prove the result that these two are equivalent. Yeah, let's call this here uh, seven. So if f inverse of y is less or equal x, this is the same as f of x is larger or equal y. So to show this first note that, yeah, we already had this from the right continuity of f, the infimum is attained, so I can use the minimum in this definition of the generalized inverse. The first thing is that I use the definition of the generalized inverse, so the definition of the generalized inverse, this was here my definition 37. So I use this definition, which tells me that F inverse of Y is just the minimum of all C such that F of C is larger or equal Y. And that means this condition here on the left-hand side, F inverse of Y smaller and equal, smaller than equal, uh, smaller and equal X is just the same as having this minimum of this set to be smaller and equal x. So this part here is just equivalent to this part here. By just plugging in the definition of f inverse. So now I need to prove that this here is equivalent, yeah, the same than that. So let's prove that I can go from here, from left to right to this implies f of x is larger or equal to y. Okay, so why is that? Okay, because f is a monotone function. This means if x is smaller than x, then f of x is smaller than f of x. Well, it's not strictly monotone. So if C is smaller or equal X, then F of C is smaller or equal F of X. So this means that if X is larger or equal to C, so I have that condition fulfilled, I know that then the F of X is larger or equal to the F of C. So the f of x is also larger or equal that guy. So it's also larger or equal the y. So it has to be in this set. So it is in the set of all c for which f of c is larger or equal y. So this means f of x is larger or equal the y. Okay, so that's the guy from left to right. 
So now let's prove that we can go from right to left. Okay, so let's prove the other side from right to left. So I have that f of x is large or equal y. So this means if I look at the set of all xi, for which f of xi is large or equal y, the x is of course in the set. So I have that the x is in the set. But if I take the minimum of all values that are in this set, of course the x is yeah, larger or equal. So the minimum is smaller or equal uh, than the x. Okay, that was the side from right to left. Okay, so I arrive here at f of x is larger or equal y. So the two are equivalent. So I have proven seven. So this together gives me seven. Yeah, now let's prove our lemma. Yeah, so the lemma is I start with a uniform distributed random variable u. Okay, and I would like to generate an f distributed one. So claim is f inverse of u is an f distributed random variable. So first recall that the u has the distribution function g, which is zero for x less than zero, then it is just linear, you know, it's uniform between zero and one, and then it's just one for x larger than one. So that guy here is my distribution function g for the uniform one. So this means the probability that u is less or equal u, that's just the definition of the distribution function. This is my g of u. So for any u that is in this interval zero one, where my uniform random numbers come from, the g of u is just the u. Then I would like to look at the distribution of x. Yeah? So I'm looking at the quantity that constitutes the distribution function of x. So the probability that capital X is less or equal little x. Though so the first thing is I plug in the definition of x. So the definition of x is it's f inverse of u. So I have that f inverse of capital U, the random variable capital U, is less or equal x. And now I can use my little tool, the number seven, that I can just throw the f on the other side, okay? So then I just have that the u is less or equal the f of the little x. And now I plug in that the p of u less or equal u is just the u. So I see that this here is just the f of little x. So I see that the random variable capital X that I have defined in this way has distribution function f, so it is f distributed. That's it. Yeah, that's a very nice lemma. Yeah, so we now have the x has distribution function f. And as long as I have an inverse of the distribution function, the F inverse, I can just take my sequence of uniform random numbers, apply this function, and I have the F distributed sequence. Okay, so we are again talking about uh, random variables and you might ask yourself, okay, does this also work if we use the quasi Monte Carlo methods where the sequence U has low discrepancy, yeah, but it's not even random. Uh, so does this also work? And we have a nice coding example yeah, at the end today, um, where you see that it works. 
And it's obvious to see what is what is happening because it is just this transformation, this substitution that we already did inside the integral. So if you take a look back at our Monte Carlo integration using the quasi Monte Carlo method, yeah, we were looking at a given function f, so the function we like to maybe integrate. So I now assume that I'm not looking at expectation of f of u, yeah, which was my Monte Carlo integral. I'm looking now at expectation f of x, where x is constructed using this inversion method. So I have here that little x is f inverse of little u. So that means that u is f of x. And if you differentiate, that means du is f prime of x. Well, f prime here being the density. So du is f prime of x dx. So if you call f prime phi, yeah, then this is the density of x, du is phi of x dx. So this means I can represent here the expectation as the integral f of x, phi of x dx, but then doing the substitution x is f inverse of u. This means phi of x dx is just the du. And I'm just integrating now f of f inverse of u. So x is f inverse of u over the transformed domain, over the transformed domain zero one. So if you look now, at this, yeah, so that actually my inversion of the distribution function method is just this substitution that we already sometimes did when we were calculating different in integrals. You see what the Coxma Lafka inequality, so looking at quasi the quasi Monte Carlo method, now looks like. So I'm considering here, of course, on the right-hand side, again, this part here. So this is the discrepancy of the uniform sequence and the variation of the function I am integrating. This is my estimate. But on the left-hand side, of course, I can just use the substituted values. So I'm approximating the expectation by the Monte Carlo approximation f of xi. Yeah? So of course, uh, f of xi is little f of capital F inverse ui. So you see that um, what we are doing here just taking here a sequence that has a different distribution by doing this F inverse method, just translates to the coxma lafka inequality, where the relevant thing is the discrepancy of the sequence, the uniform sequence that was used inside this transformation method. So to some extent, we are not doing something new. Uh, we are just doing the steps um, maybe in different areas. Yeah? So one part of your code is generating the random number sequences. And now there's already a transformation going on in this part that if you would do it the other way would be part of your integration method. Okay, so of course I can expect that this works if the sequence that generates the uniforms has low discrepancy. Uh, a few remarks. So first, the method appears to make 
um, a very strong assumption. Yeah. So namely that the inverse of the distribution function is known. And it's known analytically, so I have to have a formula in the computer. And for my motivational example, I mentioned the normal distribution. You already know the normal distribution. You do not have an inverse of the cumulative distribution function. Um, so often there is no closed formula for the ICDF. But this is not a big issue. Usually there are very fast and very good approximations. I even have an approximation that guarantees that the error is below machine precision. So our 10 to the minus 16 relative error. And now you see that it's also nice that in the beginning of our lecture, we had this chapter on computer arithmetic before, because if you have such an approximation that is accurate up to machine precision, you now know that you there is no difference between the closed formula in the compu implemented computer and this approximation. Actually, it for the computer, it is indistinguishable. However, even if you do not have um, an approximation that is as good as machine precision, yeah? so even if the error would be larger than machine precision, then there are some um, things that you can do. First thing, which is maybe not so good, it may be tempting to improve the accuracy by a numerical method, for example, a root finder. Yeah. So doing like a Newton method. So if you have F, but you do not have inverse, it's tempting maybe to just improve the accuracy by doing some numerical root finding. But this is sometimes not a good idea because uh, numerical root finding is, uh, for example, it, it can be discontinuous yeah? because sometimes you iterate 10 steps until you have your result. Sometimes you iterate 11 steps or whatever, and it's maybe not a robust method. And the remark that is maybe more important to us here is that in many applications, the inaccuracy in this inversion of the distribution function or in this function is usually good to control. For example, our motivation was a model for a stock and we used the normal distribution. Well, in reality, the stock will not follow a normal distribution. So we have to calibrate our parameters anyway. And the true distribution is not known. And we perform calibration by choosing our model parameters such, such that what our model generates is very close to what we observe. So in this setup, it, it's maybe not a big deal if the model is not 100% analytically normal. Yeah? So in some cases, yeah, we have maybe examples later, but in some examples, you can check this error as part of your model calibration error, does your model match the observed value? And in some situation, you can just reduce the error also by the calibration procedure. Okay, so I already made the remark that improving the accuracy here with a numerical root finder is uh, maybe not a good idea, yeah, it is, uh, can be more accurate, but the function will maybe exhibit discontinuities. And maybe I have a few examples later where these discontinuities become relevant. Yeah, for example, if you approximate finite differences with small numbers, yeah, this can create errors. A second remark, this may be a bit subtle, yeah. So here I just looked on the interval 0, 1, 0, not included, 1, not included. But if you look at the implementation of a root finder, so for example, here, our Java util random, you see that it generates a value between 0, 1, where 0 is included, 1 is not included. 
So now if you think of, for example, the normal distribution, yeah, the value zero is then maybe mapped to minus infinity. The value one is would be, if it would be generated, mapped to plus infinity. A small warning, yeah, it's important maybe to check the domain of your implementation. What is your inversion of the cumulative distribution function doing at special values? For example, special values like zero or one, which for the normal distribution would be mapped to minus infinity and plus inf infinity respectively. And then you also have to check this in combination with your uniform random number generator. Does the uniform random number generator generate these values where plus or minus infinity occur? So we, we have a code session on this. Yeah? So let's consider now an example, the normal distributed random variable. So for a standard normal distributed random variable, so the guy that we looked in our motivation, the random variable X, the density is known analytically. So the density is here one divided by square root of two P exponential minus X squared half. Okay, but the integral, you know, the distribution function and the inverse of the distribution function, unfortunately, no analytic formula is known. However, we have implementations, very high accurate implementations that are piecewise rational approximations, uh, which are accurate up to the floating point double machine precision. So I have here an example of this implementation that we can also look at this. Yeah, maybe let's do that. Let's look in the computer and check if this method really works. So let's create a new class. This is my class, normal ICDF experiments. Yeah, so I do some experiments with the normal distribution. And the first one is I would like to maybe just plot the density. How does the density look like? So I plot the density uh, say of the input that is the uniform and the output, you know, so that is the normal via the ICDF inversion method. So that is the first experiment I would like to do with you. So how do I do this? Okay, I have a little helper that creates a plot and this helper needs just uh, the samples as lists. So let's create these lists. So these are the uniforms. So this is an array list of floating point doubles. And Let's also have a list where I do the normals. Okay, so then how many sample points do we use? Okay, let's have some constant here. So number of sample points, this is say 100,000 sample points. So I have a loop. running over all those points. Okay, I need a random number generator for, whoops. Yeah, I need a random number generator for the uniforms. So let's use our Mersenne twister. Yeah, maybe let's use it with a certain seat here. So let's create now a uniform from that. Okay, and then create a normal distributed one, a normal sample from the uniform. So now I need this function and I already have an implementation of this function. So there is, um, 
a class where I have such an implementation and it is uh, the implementation I have mentioned on the slide. So we can have a look at this. Yeah. So there is the inverse cumulative normal distribution function following this uh, paper here, yeah, this, this algorithm. And if you look at it, you see that looks a bit ugly, but it is just the ratio of two polynomials. Yeah. So just depending on certain ranges where the argument lies. I just approximate it with a certain polynomial. Yeah, and these guys here are just the coefficients. And it's guaranteed that is accurate up to machine precision. Okay, so I already have this uh, function here. So let's um, add now this uniform to the list of uniforms and add the normal to the list of normals. And then I have populated these two data sets and I have a small helper that creates a plot of density. So this is here the uniforms and he needs some discretization of his X axis. I mean, he will create a histogram, yeah, a histogram. And also here a standard deviation. So for the size, how wide should be the histogram? Okay, so there's this little helper. Uh, maybe I also set a title for this. So this is here the uniform, say from, okay, so from what? So let's just take here the random number generator as the text, yeah? and then I can show this plot. Okay, and I would like to also have a plot for the normals. Okay, so let's try this and let's check if this works. Okay, so this is your density from your Mersenne twister, density on the U of the uniforms. Okay, so like expected is wiggling here around one and that is now the transformed value. Uh, let's check if my claim is right that I can also use this for my other random number generator for my quasi random number generator, say the Van der Koppel sequence. So let's reuse a little bit the code um, and make here this random number generator an argument. Yeah. So this is now an argument here. So now he complains here that this method with this argument does not exist, but I can change here the method. And now the method has, takes here the random number generator as an argument. Okay, and then it's nice because I'm also printing here in the title, the name of the random number generator. So I can just now use my code here um, again with a different random number generator. And I use now the random number generator So there it is now my van der Korput sequence. So I had a class here van der Korput sequence where I can give a base yeah, and maybe I should, yeah, that argument is now plot, uh, plugged in into my plotting function. Maybe I should here call this guy then mess and twister. Okay, so I'm now plotting for the mess and twister, this sample, this density plot, and I plotted for the van der Koppel sequence. So let's have a look how this looks like. Okay, and now we get something like that. Okay, so you see that, of course, the van der Koppel sequence is sampling the uniform interval much more evenly because that is what, what the low discrepancy sequences tries to. Yeah, they try to distribute the point points much better. So you get a much nicer uniform distribution. And you also see that you get a much nicer normal distributed density. Yeah, so 
the density looks quite looks quite right. So from that picture, you would say, okay, quasi Monte Carlo is really much much better. Let's do it. Yeah, uh, pseudo Monte Carlo with the mass and twister mm, doesn't look so nice. Um, I will have maybe another session with you when we look again at the curse of dimension. So what happens in higher dimension? And you will see that in higher dimension, then pseudo random numbers again have have maybe a, an advantage. Yeah? So um, sometimes maybe these these errors here do not hurt so much if you are in high high dimensions. Yeah, that was uh, maybe a nice first example that um, this method works. So going back to the slide here, yeah, we saw that it also looks very nice here for the quasi Monte Carlo method where you use the van der Korput sequence. I gave you here this warning yeah, that we maybe should check a little bit the special values. And let me give you an example where this is now relevant, for example, for the normal distributed random variable. Consider again that we have here our model for the stock S, so S of capital T, which I plug in into some financial product which is in my case now a put option. So I'm paying maximum of K minus S of T. So what happens now if I take the Java Util random number generator that could create the value U equals zero. Also a Sobol sequence uh, has u equals zero as the first element. So if u is equal zero, the inverse of the normal distribution will map u equals zero to z minus infinity, at least formally. Yeah? I mean, we have to check what the implementation does. So in my model, and this is here, now say a Bachelier model, I would then get here a Z of minus infinity, which would then mean that the S of capital T would become a minus infinity, which would mean that in my put option, I get here a plus infinity. The maximum of plus infinity and zero would give me a plus infinity for the payoff. So I would actually get here for maybe a certain Monte Carlo sample path. So this is of course only for some omega i. I would get for some omega i here a plus infinity in my payoff function. But now since you know computer arithmetic, if you take a sum and one element is plus infinity, all the elements will be plus infinity or not a number. Yeah, if there will be a minus infinity, yeah, for which you add, then maybe you get not a number, but that would not happen here. We would get a plus infinity in the result. So it means our final result is just a plus infinity because of this numerical thing here. So we should maybe compare the behavior of different implementations of our ICDF uh, for different numbers. So what actually happens if we use the value zero? So with the normal distribution, the inverse of the normal distribution, normal distributed cumulative distribution function, what happens at these special values? But maybe we should also check um, are here the other values. Okay, so the very smallest number, which is not zero, that is two to the power of minus 53. Okay, why that? Yeah, if you think of the Java util random number generator, we had that. 
Uh, we had here this small session, yeah, how he transform the integer to the floating point number. And he was just dividing by a constant for the float, it was two to the power of 24. And for the double, he was dividing actually by two to the power of 53. Now you can go back to the implementation. You see that is here the generator for the floating point double. And you see he's actually here dividing by two to the power of 53. So this means that, so this means that here the um, random numbers go in steps of one divided by two to the power of 53 or two to the power of minus 53. So my random number generator generates a zero, a one divided by two to the power of 53, a two divided by two to the power of 53 and so on. This is what my uniform random number generator generates here, this is my u. And from that, I will here create the x. So of course, you have that the one half should be mapped by your inversion of the distribution function to the zero. And then, okay, these guys here should be mapped to corresponding values. Yeah, so does this work? Uh, is now the question. And what's happening here to say the one? Is it mapped to plus infinity and the zero, is it mapped to minus infinity? Let's have a small um, experiment um, on that by creating some kind of um, round trip. So here are now my code sessions, my numerical experiment. So the first one we already did. So we plotted a histogram here for Mersenne Twister. Yeah, we did that and for the Van der Korput sequence. And now let's investigate the limit cases and implement some kind of round trip. So um, we will calculate first X by applying F inverse to U. So here it's capital Phi, but actually it should be the F. And then we uh, calculate again from the X by applying the distribution function, you know, not the inverse, the F uh, to the X. We uh, uh, apply this and calculate the U again, and we will check, do we get the same U and what happens? Let's uh, try a small experiment and also check maybe some special values. Um, Okay, so um, so maybe I call this function check ICDF implementations, okay? And um, I would like to check the implementation for different values, yeah? So maybe I could just say the uniform number is 0.5, and I would like to check now the implementation for that uniform. So test ICDF implementation for this uniform. Okay, so the first thing I would like to do is I would like to create from that uniform the normal. So let's call this the X and that is the ICDF applied to the uniform. So the ICDF applied to the uniform. So I need some uh, function, so let's Choose that as an argument. Okay, so let's print the guys. So first my uniform, let's call it U. 
And then my transformed variable, let's call it um, say x. So this is my x of u. Let's make it a bit nicer. That's my, my normal. No, maybe I call it normal. Okay, then let's take this normal and apply the distribution function to get back a uniform. So I need a cumulative distribution function. So let's also provide this as an argument here so I can later test different implementations. So let's have a CDF and I calculate from the normal now, the uniform, and I print that. So this is now again the U of X of U. So that's now my uniform for the norm. So let's do now this test for, say, an implementation. And uh, we have different implementations at hand. So there is the ICDF or the normal ICDF, say from the Apache Common Math Library. Yeah? This is a mathematical library. So maybe we use that. So this is uh, the fully qualified name is Apache org Apache Commons Math 3 distributions. And then there is something called here normal distribution. And from that guy, okay, he doesn't provide a static method. So I have to create an object. So let's call this object normal. Uh, I have to create an object. So if I have this guy here, then I can say X. Okay, that here is the ICDF. So it maps you to the inverse cumulative distribution function to the X. So I have this guy. And I also have from the Apache, the normal CDF. So this is the cumulative distribution function. So that maps now the X to uh, the U. Yeah. So the F of X. Mm -hmm. This guy here is the F inverse. And this guy here is the F. So now I can check here this little round trip, yeah. Uh, what was the uniform I provided? I calculate the normal from it via the inverse. So print it, calculate back the normal. I can now check this little round trip here for different values. So maybe here for 0.5. So the first argument is the CDF. The second argument is the ICDF. Okay, maybe, maybe I reverse the arguments. I first have the ICDF and then I have the uh, CDF. Okay, that's just because I will change later only the, the uh, inverse, yeah, when we look at the other implementation. So now I can try this, yeah? So let's try this little test. I just, just disable here, comment out my little plots, yeah? So that not always the plots pop up and I can run this program. And we see the following result. Uh, the center point of my uniform, it's mapped to the center point of the normals. Uh, and if you do again, the round trip, go back, you get again, back um, 0.5. So indeed I have here this brown line in my plot, the center point one half is mapped to zero and the zero is mapped back to one half. Okay, so we have this uh, correspondence. 
let's check now um, a very small point. Yeah, so maybe I place here the argument here so I can just copy always this line. So the smallest non-zero random number generated by the random number generator is two to the power of minus 53. Let's check this value. Okay, so maybe I print a little bit stuff to separate this here. So Yeah. Or maybe I just do it like that. So maybe a bit low. Um, let's try that. Okay, so you see, this is here my small machine precision. Yeah, it's actually one half. Uh, the step between uh, one and one plus and 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 the next one uh, number, yeah. So you know, double precision has two divided by two to the power of fifty-two, yeah. But since we are in the interval from zero to one, yeah, we can get another one half. Okay, we had a discussion on that. Yeah, that's just our machine precision epsilon here. So my um, uniform random numbers go in steps of the machine precision epsilon. And he's mapping this in the normal distribution to a minus 8.2. So I also have this here on the slide. So this guy goes here to a minus 8.2. And the root back also works from the minus 8.2, if I calculate now the distribution function, I get the epsilon back. Okay, so looks everything looks very accurate here. Huh? So the round round trip um, also works. Um, let's also check a much smaller number. So we can check double min value. Yeah? So double min value, a constant holding the largest positive finite value. Oh, sorry, that's max value, the largest. I would like to have min value, yeah? A constant holding the smallest positive non-zero value of tab double. This is two to the power of minus 1074. Huh? Let's take that guy and have a look what's happening. Okay, so um, he will round this to minus infinity and minus infinity will go to a zero. Let's check the zero and the one, the special points zero and one. And maybe also check the largest value that is not one. Let's take here one minus two to the power of minus 53. So the guy that is before. Okay, so for zero, I get minus infinity. Minus infinity is mapped back to zero. Okay, that looks that looks nice and consistent. For one, I get plus infinity. Plus infinity is mapped back to one. That also looks nice and consistent. And also the in the random number generator, the largest random number that is not one. Uh, so for the Java util random that does not generate generate a one. The largest random number that is generator is also nicely mapped to plus 0.2. Huh? So that also looks very nice and consistent. So that's this guy here. It's also mapped to 0.2. And this situation here where we have this rounding, this cannot happen yeah, because this is not a random number that is generated by the random number generator. Yeah? So he will generate either the zero or he will generate this number. Okay, so an issue where, where that I have with this generator here is that he will generate plus and minus infinity. And for that reason, I would like to now discuss another implementation. Uh, namely, let's check what happens if I use the 
implementation that I already used here in the other example. This guy here from, from that paper, because this implementation is slightly different. So um, I just use it for the ICDF. So I just repeat here this example. So this is now This is the ICDF from Apache Common Math. And now I would like to test the ICDE. Well, this is here, this virtual implementation. So I can use here the same code. So let's create here the double unary operator. So it maps you to the normal distribution, the inverse. So cumulative normal distribution using this implementation. So actually you can shorten this notation here and just write here double dot without you, uh, double, double, double dot. Okay, that was the error. Okay, so I just use this guy here. Now, instead of the Apache implementation, and we will have um, a look. Yeah, maybe let's plot here a small separator that we see it's now something different. And I do the same experiment now with the other implementation. Okay, so let's have a look at the output. So you see again, the middle point, yeah, it's mapped to uh, zero. Yeah, zero is mapped back to the middle point, the same result as here. Uh, also for the two to the power of minus 53, yeah, it maps to 0 .8 point, uh, minus 8.2. Okay, there's a slight difference here in the last digits, but it's um, machine precision was the claim. Yeah. Um, this guy here is actually working nicer. So you see the very small uniform is mapped to minus 38. Maybe that's reasonable, I don't know. But now the funny thing is if I use the cumulative distribution function from the Apache implementation, I get back the right number. So you see that the inverse cumulative of the Apache library actually did this here to the minus infinity, yeah, which he could, could, could do better. And now comes a little surprise. If we plug in U, we would from a mathematician expect that we get minus infinity. But he is mapping the U with the minus infinity to a zero and the round trip breaks. So I get an 0.5. And the same happens for the one. If you plug in one, you would as a mathematician expect, expect plus infinity, but he is mapping this to zero and we get an 0 0.5. And now to conclude this session, I, I personally really like this behavior here much more. It's mathematically not correct. So you should maybe document it in your Java doc documentation that this happens. But why is this better? from an implementation point of view. So what this algorithm does is it maps the limit points, it maps the limit points here to the zero. And the thing is that then in my implementation, it will not happen that I get a plus infinity, which could destroy the whole result like in this example, yeah, where plus infinity is propagating here through the whole algorithm yeah, and then destroys the whole result. And also note that my uniform random number generator is actually not symmetric. He's generating the zero, 
but he's not generating the one. And the reason is that two to the power of 53 is an even number. Yeah? So there is nothing in the middle. So actually by throwing away the zero, it makes the whole sampling symmetric. So I could say I do not generate the zero, um, but then, okay, how do you do this? Okay, so just map the zero to a number that occurs anyway very often. So just map the zero to the zero. So, so that's maybe not a bug, it's maybe a feature. It will make the whole implementation much more robust and guarantees that plus infinity does not occur. Um, and I want to conclude with a small example. Okay, I do not have time, so I just don't write the code now newly, but I just take the code that is prepared. So if you like to look at this at home, of course, you can just take a look in our repository where every these experiments are. And I also have here the experiments that do the plots for different other um, generators. And maybe I just take here the Sobol number generator, okay? The Sobol number generator, and let's just run that experiment now to conclude the session. So Sobel numbers was also um, a sequence that is a low discrepancy sequence. Yeah, very smooth generation here. So, but now if you look at the code where I do this plot for the Sobol, okay. So um, I use here this Apache common mass ICDF to do the inversion. Yeah, so I use here this guy to do the inversion. And the Sobel number generator has the property that the first element he's generating is actually the zero. And you see that I'm removing here the first element because I know this is harmful. Assume I have, I would have forgotten that. Yeah? Then if you now run the program, you just get no result. Uh, and that's just maybe a remark, such errors are very hard maybe to track because now I have to look, okay, there's somewhere is an infinity generated that destroys the whole calculation and where does this infinity come from? So that's maybe the reason why I like a little bit that this implementation maps the limit point zero one, not to plus and minus infinity, it maps that it, it maps it to zero. That was it for today. Thanks.